This concept, the concept of effective stresses is going to follow you from this point on until the time that you have some kind of interaction between soil and structure. Alright, so with that in mind, let's just start talking about the concept of effective stresses and see how things work out when you're looking at the material. Let me just quickly go over where we are right now and what we're going to come to from this point on. This was the material that we covered so far. We talked about the physical properties of soil and the structure, right? From this point on, you'll see the application of the solid mechanics or mechanics of materials that you're familiar with in the soil. So from this point on, it's going to be all about the stress calculations, the strain calculations. The last strain calculations would be the deformation and settlement behavior. And things are going to be very different from the way that you're familiar with in concrete and steel. Remember for the case of concrete, you basically will assign one modulus value, one stiffness property, and you are able to figure out what the deformations are, or where the material will fail, essentially. Right? So here we have an entirely different tolerance in terms of the deformation, meaning that you might have just a little bit of deformation, but at the end of the day, you might see that your uh, structure is still serviceable and can provide load distribution in the system. All right, so the material that we're going to cover from this point on, we start with the concept of infective stresses, we will talk a little, a little bit about the movement of water in the soil, the seepage forces, and how they are related to the permeability of the soil, and ultimately how things are essentially related to uh, the settlement analysis of the soil that we covered on our last chapter of the course. Then we talk about the stress calculations. Um, stress calculations in this specific uh, terminology has to do with the, the stresses associated with the external forces, such as the weight of this structure at the top of the foundation. And then we'll talk about the sheer strength of the soil, how we can determine the strength properties of the soil, and the last topic is going to be the settlement analysis, or in other words, it's going to be the deformation or the strain component of the, the stress the strain program. All right, so from this point on, again, everything is going to be essentially correlated with the solid mechanics, the stress calculations, and how things are working when we're looking at the dissipation of the stresses within a All right, so we are talking about the concept of effective stresses. My suggestion to you is that make sure that from this point on, you're very really diligent in terms of taking notes. And you will see that the material that I have in my uh, lecture notes or lecture slides, you see that I put a lot of words in it. But previous to this part, you see I had one big huge graph, and then we'll talk about it. Now we are going to see a lot of words in the lecture notes, because you have to be familiar with, familiar with yourself with what is going on in terms of the definitions. And the other thing that we do from this point on is we are going to deviate a little bit from your textbook. What that means is that I look at six different textbooks and select the parts that best explains each topic. If you look at the concept of the effective stress in your, in your textbook, it's about a page and a half, not more than that. But the material that we cover here is coming, especially this chapter is coming from another book that is in your uh, syllabus, the book from Buddha, and he has a very good chapter on the effective stresses. So we'll, we'll see how things will work out, but for this specific lecture and the lecture afterwards, we deviate a little bit from the typical um, textbook that we Alright, so let's talk about the concept of effective stresses. Do you agree with that from the phase diagram standpoint? 
let's assume that you're looking at a p-value, which is applied at the top of this zone. And so since the soil is fully saturated, what's the status of the water inside those void rate voids? Water completely filled the void spaces. Do you agree with that? So that's basically the definition of the fully saturated state. There is no air in the system. Right? All right, so here's what we have. We have the p-value, which is the total load that is happening at the top of the soil. And then you have multiple solid grains that they are interacting with one another. Right? Remember what we had in terms of the definition or the mechanism for the load distribution inside the system. The load transfers through the interaction between the solid grains. Do you agree with that? So we looked at the interparticle frictional forces and how these individual solid grains are essentially interacting with one another. All right, so this was the general component that we have. All right, so tell me how I should calculate the total stresses. This is coming from your mechanics of material. Remember, the total of stress is P over A. Do you agree with that? The magnitude of the load that we have over the cross sectional area. So that gives me the total of stresses. Now, this total of stress can be subdivided into two main components. One component has to do with the interaction of the solid grains. The other one has to do with the stresses that are carried by water inside the void spaces. Does that make sense? So basically you can decompose the total stress into two components. The intergranular stresses, which are essentially the stresses felt by the solid grains in the system. The other one is core water pressure, which is the stress core, P-O-R-E, for water pressure, which is basically the stresses that are felt by the water inside the void spaces. Right. So this is for the case of fully saturated system that we have. So let's write them down and see how these are essentially related to one another. I can subdivide this by intergranular stresses. So tell me how I can calculate these intergranular stresses. This has to do with P1 over A1 plus P2 over A2 plus P3 over A3. What is P1? Yes, it's basically the projection of total stress, the P that we have for void assembly number one. Right, void and solid grain assembly number one. And this is going to be perpendicular to the plane of contact. Right? Remember, these are we're talking about the frictional forces. I remember how you calculate the friction. Right? Friction was the normal force divided by the contact area that we have. And that's the reason that each of these are essentially perpendicular to that plane that we have in this specific case. So what do we have here? We have P1, P2, P3. In very simple terms, this would be the share of the load that is transferred to this specific contact. Share for assembly, this is the second assembly would be for P2, and ultimately this would be P3. And we know that we have multiple or numerous number of solid grains that are going to interact with one another. All right, so this would be the first component that we have. And the second component has to do with the water within the cavity. So you have U1 plus U2 plus U3 plus all the pore water pressure in each of these cavities that we have divided by the number of pores 
intergranular stresses, which we show it with sigma prime. And the last one is pressure inside the void structure. Pressure of water inside the void structure that Alright. So let's take a look at these. Let's dissect them and see which one are which one we can simplify, and which one we can calculate, which one we can measure. Alright. So let's take a look at the void spaces. Remember we talked about we have two types of we have isolated voids and we have interconnected voids, right? For this specific case, we are looking at fully saturated state. With good degree of certainty, you can assume that these voids are connected to one another. What's the implication of that? It means that when you apply the load and a portion of the stresses that are going to be transferred within the water in the system, that will result in similar pressure in different locations for the water because they are connected to one another. In very simple terms, your U1 equals to U2 equals to U3 and things like that. So the pressure inside the voids, because of the fact that we have interconnected void structure, is going to be the same. So let's take a look at this. It will be U1 equals to U2 equals to U3 and things of like that sort. So what happens to that second term that we have? We basically will have N U1 divided by n, which is basically is going to be u1, u, right? They cancel, it means that the pressure inside is going to be the same, and therefore you can simplify the situation. Now let's write them down and see which one is so by definition, intergranular stresses, if you want to write that down, is the stresses felt by solid grains. Stresses felt with solid grains inside the soil assembly is called intergranular stresses. And that has to do with the interaction of the solid grains. That and then you have the pore water pressure, which is the pressure felt by the water inside the soil assembly. The last part was pore water pressure is the pressure felt by water inside void structure or soil void assembly. Alright, so now let's write them down and see how we can simplify this. So we have total stress. So we were able to subdivide <coughs> or decompose the total stresses. The total stress can be decomposed into two components. Component one has to do with the interaction of the solid grains, therefore we call that intergranular stresses. The second one has to do with the pressure inside the water, inside the voids, yes. And that would be core water pressure. So we have two things. This sigma prime is also called effective stresses. Effective stresses. From this point on, until the time that you retire from your career in civil engineering, whenever you do calculations of the stresses in the soil, you use sigma prime. You don't use sigma total. Because you, you have to figure out what's the contribution of the moisture inside the system. Right. We know what, what happens when, for instance, you have too little of moisture or too much of moisture in your compaction. Right. Remember, you had two sides of the compaction curve. Up until a certain point, 
you basically will see the positive contribution of the amount of moisture in terms of the lubricating agent. Right? On the other side, it basically compromises the stiffness properties and the density properties, which ultimately results in the reduction of the density. Sometimes it's going to be correlated with the reduction of the modulus value, or reduction of the stiffness properties, or reduction of the load gearing capacity of your soil. So from this point on, whenever we talk about the stresses in the soil, you calculate the total stresses, you figure out what the pore water pressure is, and you subtract the two to figure out what that sigma prime is. And from this point on, sigma prime is also called the design stress. So we have so many names for it. We have intergranular stresses that comes from the concept, right? The theoretical concept. The second one is effective stresses, right? That's something that you see in the literature. And the third one is when you go about doing the design. For the design purposes, you use sigma prime. If you use sigma, you basically end up with erroneous measure of the stresses. So you have to use sigma prime. And you see when you start talking about the stress calculations and the shear strength of the soil, you see that all our equations are a function of sigma prime. They're not a function of sigma. So there are something that you can basically figure out from this one. Alright, so let's think about that, again coming from your mechanics of materials. How do you calculate total stresses? We just talked about that, right? So you need to know the total magnitude of the load. In addition to that, you need to know the cross-sectional area. Let's bring it on and talk about, for instance, this building. What would be the total load? Right, you guys are senior engineers. You have to think about, remember ACI code, you have, yes, you have dead load, you have light yield, you have inflation factors that you have, you low values, you multiply a different value to the dead load compared to the live load. Now, if you have, for instance, wind load, if you have earthquake loads, you also have different combinations of the loading conditions that we have. So you're familiar with that. So that would be your total load. And how about the cross-sectional area? Where does the cross-sectional area come from? That would be the area of the foundation beneath this building, right? So remember what the role of the foundation was? The role of the foundation is transmit the loads to the soil, the weakest link that we have, which is basically the soil, right? So the area of foundation is essentially the same as the area of contact. So very simple terms. Can I calculate total stress? Yes, you can, right? So you have the information about the load, you have information about the cross-section, and therefore you can get the contact stresses. What's the contact stress? The stresses at the contact of foundation and the soil. How about a few feet below that? For that, we have to come back after the spring break when we talk about the distribution or dissipation of the stresses within the soil. We know that the stresses become smaller and smaller as you move down the depth. Also, they become smaller and smaller as you move away from the point of application of the load, right? So we have double distribution of the load, both with depth and radial offset. We'll talk about that at some other point. So you can calculate the contact stresses at that point. So we got that taken care of. How about the pore water pressure? Can I calculate the pore water pressure? Can I measure the pore water pressure? This is coming from your hydraulics and anything related to the water. Remember, we have piezometers. You can stick a sand, sand pipe or a piezometer in the soil, and based on the height of the capillary rise, you can get an indication of the pressure of the water within the medium. Right? So you can also get an indication of that pore water pressure. We talk about in our next lecture how you can calculate it as well. Right? So let me see what I can do here. This one, I can calculate it. I can measure it as well with Python. Total stress. I can calculate it. P over A. Can I measure it? Pretty big scale. What do you do first thing in the morning? Some of you probably stepped on this scale. Right? <laughs> so what happens there? You basically, you can have an indication of the weight. And what is the weight? It's basically a load set. If you place a load cell, you can get an indication of the pressure. So you can embed load cells within the soil, and based on that, you can also measure the weight, and that weight is essentially correlated with the stresses that we have. 
All right, so how about the effective stress estimate? I know. If you get the type of soil, you can see it. All right, so yes, that's a lot. So how we can calculate it? You have to figure out the contact point between every single soil grain. Can we do that? No. 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 Right? So you cannot calculate it. Can I measure it? You can't measure it yet. So how do you come up with that? You basically calculate exactly. You calculate your total stresses. You calculate your pore water pressure. The difference between the two will be the effective stresses. So you can calculate it based on the other two entities that we have. But individually, you cannot calculate. Make sense? So from this point on, when we talk about the calculation of the effective stresses, you know that you have to calculate your total load, you have to figure out what the contact area is, figure out what your total stress is. Then the next step would be figuring out what the pore water pressure is. Once you figure out what the pore water pressure is, the next step would be finding the difference between the two. The difference between the two essentially gives you the effective stresses or that sigma prime that we are in. And once you get the sigma prime, now you can do a lot of things with that sigma prime. One of them would be the estimation of the strength of the material. So that's basically where we're going with this concept. Alright, so let's quickly take a look at these diagrams that you might be familiar with. So in total state, We have vertical stress and you have horizontal stresses. That V stands for vertical, H stands for horizontal. Similarly, you have sigma prime V. Horizontal stresses, we show them with sigma sub h, h for horizontal, and vertically it would be vertical pressure or vertical stresses that would be <coughs> sigma sub v, vertical, v4, vertical. <coughs> you put a prime there when you're looking at the effective stresses, and then you have the pore water pressure. Yes, so the pressure inside the water is in isotropic stress state. Remember we talked about the isotropy and anisotropy? What was the iso means? Remember, if you can subdivide or basically subsegment these two, it would be isos and tropos. Iso was similar and tropos was property. So it means that it's a similar property. We're talking about the stresses. It would be similar magnitude of the stresses from different direction. It's called isotropic stress state. Isotropic stress state is a stress state where the, is, where the stress intensity is similar in different directions, or the stress magnitude. So when you have the stress magnitude similar in different directions, that's called the isotropic stress state. It's also called hydrostatic stress state. Isotropic stress state, hydrostatic stress state, also neutral state. Neutral means that there is no directional dependency to Vertical and horizontal, they're going to be the same. So you put a new value in all these different directions that we have. One other thing that we you can see here is that our stresses are different in vertical and horizontal direction. It's not the same as we had, for instance, for the case of concrete or for the state stages, right? So you have to identify what those values are. We're going to talk about that and how you can essentially do it. All right, any questions here? <coughs> Is it clear what we are going? The concept, I'm, I stood probably on this one about 20 minutes. I want to make sure that you understand what this means before we move forward and talk about the 
So that's, now let's start talking about what these uh, components are. And then after this slide, I'm going to talk about a few case studies, such as when the soil is completely dry, when the soil is in fully saturated state, which was what we talked about so far. And then afterwards, probably in our next lecture, and after that, we talk about void spaces that are not completely filled with water. Right? It's basically the different cases that we have. For the saturated state, all the cavities are filled with water. The case that there is no moisture in the system, again, a two-phase system, only solid particles and air in that case, and something in between, which is going to be a partially saturated state. So we're going to talk about that and see how they are compared to one another. All right, so let's talk about the decomposition of the total stresses. This slide shows the saturated soil and then carrying a vertical stress of sigma <coughs> z from this cross-sectional area. This total stress is carried by both the pore water pressure, which is essentially the water inside the cavities, and we talked about this since you're looking at the interconnected void system, the pressure inside is going to be the same all around. So in this case, you basically are looking at one pressure, which is going to be the same here and the same here. And then you have the interparticle contact forces, which call them <coughs> intergranular stresses, or sigma prime, or effective stress, or the design of stress. Right? So from this point on, these are all synonymous with one another. Right? All right, so now let's talk about our different cases. So the case one that we are looking at here is the case that the soil is fully dry. The soil is fully dry. How many phases do we have? Two. We have two phases, meaning that we only have solid grains and air in that case. All right, so what happens if I have a watertight and insulated piston here that I filled it with solid grains? And these solid grains are essentially completely dry. Therefore, the moisture content for that is going to be 0%. No water content in that specific case. We have a valve at the top. And then there is going to be a load Q that is happening at the very top. So what happens if I apply the load? What happens? Compaction. Do you agree? That's basically the mechanism of compaction, the mechanical compaction that we have. You basically expel the airborne. You will see the densification of the material associated with the reduction of the volume. The same amount of solid grains, and the height is going to go down, therefore the volume is going to go down, therefore the density will go up. Right? So that's basically what this specific case means. All right, tell me how you calculate the total stress in this case. You have a load Q, and there is going to be a contact area. right? For the contact area, remember you have to look at the perpendicular direction to the load that you have. For this specific case, let's assume that there is going to be a unit direction inside the slide, and therefore it all has to do with that area that we have, that line. That we have. All right, so very simply, you can just simply divide Q, the load, by the contact area that we have. That gives you the total stresses. There is no water in, in the system. Therefore, what would be the value of pore water pressure? Zero. It would be zero. So remember how the equation would look like. Total stress equals to effective stress plus pore water pressure. Right. So now do, what do I have here? You have total stress equals to effective stress. What does that mean in terms of the constant? It means that all the stresses are carried by granular particles. No water inside. The other thing that you have to keep in mind when you're looking at this example is that we assume that the solid grains are incompressible, right? And we assume that there is no crushing will take place when you apply the load. <coughs> How about the air? The air is compressible, right? So all the compression or the settlement in this specific case is going to be associated with the reduction of the volume of air. Right? Make sense? So this was a very simple way to look at that. That was the case <coughs> number one. All right, so now let's look at case number two, and we're going to look at it in two different ways. Now, you're looking at fully saturated. 
fully saturated state means that you have two phases. All the cavities are filled with water. You have solid grains. Tell me in terms of the compressibility of the system, assuming that the valve is closed. Incompressible. So we have the valve that's completely shut, completely closed, and I apply the load there. Solid grains are not compressible. How about the water? Is water compressible? Nope. It's not, right? All right, so now think about that, what happens? You apply this load, you change the loading conditions, and the this stresses went to something, right? Mm -hmm. But those stresses did not result in a reduction of the volume in this case. All right, so let's now think about that. When you apply the load and the valve is completely closed, the excess stresses that you applied, that Q value that we have, now will be transferred into the core water. As soon as you apply the load, you see that the pressure of the water will go up. It will go up significantly. Now, what happens to my total stress? Intergranular stress and the core water pressure. Granular is the same, core water pressure is higher, total is higher. Okay, yes, total stresses need to go up, right? So, because you have total stress, that would be Q over A. How about the other two components that we have? We have the intergranular stresses and we have the pore water pressure. Is intergranular zero? Yes, the pore water pressure will go up. But the intergranular stresses, what does that do to the intergranular stresses? Stay the same. Let me remind you that the valve is closed. So they never contact basically, right? The soil particles and the piston? What Jeremiah is basically saying is that the load that you applied at the top will result in the increase in the pore water pressure and essentially presses the solid grains away from one another. Mm -hmm. From zero? That's what you said. That's what I was going to All right, so that's what happens when the valve is closed. Now, what happens if I open the valve? Yes, you see a jet of water will escape the system, right? Yeah. So what happens? Tell me what happens to the total stress, what happens to the effective stress, and what happens to the pore water pressure. Water is going to reduce. goes down. Pore is going to reduce. Okay, so that was excellent. <laughs> I was able to pick out the transfer the stress will transfer from pore water pressure to the intergranular stresses. And that's the main concept behind the transference of the stresses from the pore water to the solid grains. So let's quickly take a look at the second case. And that's exactly what you guys described. This would be the case that we open the valve. As soon as you open the valve, you see that there is expulsion of the water from the system. Do we see any reduction in the volume? Yes, you see that right? the water leaves the system, and therefore you see that settlement will take place. In our chapter 9, we talk about the different types of settlement that we have. Part of the settlement has to do with immediate settlement associated with the elastic behavior of the medium. That's similar to what you had in your concrete and in your steel design. But the second component of the stress, which is extremely, extremely important and probably the predominant component of the stresses when you have high clay layers or highly plastic clay layers, is related to the dissipation of the pore water pressure in the system. Meaning that as soon as the water gradually leaves the system, you see the layer of the soil is going to compress and ultimately will result in the of the it will be increasing the density with reduction in the thickness of the layer. <coughs> so that's basically what it means. All right, so let's quickly take a look at the definition here before we go and talk about the stress transference concept that some of you just mentioned during the discussion. All right, this would be the case that we have a valve here. If the valve is provided in 
The valve provided in the piston is open. Immediately, there will be an expulsion of water through the hole in the piston. The flow of water continues for some time and then stops. When does it stop? When the equilibrium is reached. When does the equilibrium <coughs> When the excess pore water pressure associated with the load is completely dissipated. That's when the equilibrium <coughs> will take place. Alright, so we can subdivide again the stresses in this case. You have total stress, it can be subdivided in a total of uh, this intergranular stress and the pore water pressure. Alright, so now that we are talking about that stress transparency, so let's plot them. That would be very interesting. Let's assume I'm looking at stress versus time. <coughs> the total of stress doesn't change with time. Do you agree? Total stress Q over A. The magnitude of load doesn't change. Also, the cross sectional area doesn't change. Therefore, your total stress is going to be the same. Now, tell me the components the defective stress and the full water pressure. Is this for the previous case? Sharon, which one is the total stress, which one is the effective stress, which one is the poor water pressure? At time equals to zero. As soon as I apply the load. Assuming this basically resembles the valve closed condition. This is going to be the water? The, the total stress is the one that is constant, the one that you're showing is, has to do with the load over the area. That doesn't change. Doesn't change. Right. So we have two other components, which the sum of them <coughs> will result in the total stress. At any component, if you add this plus this, ends up to be total stress. At any time increment. But these two are functions of time, as you can see. Mm -hmm. They are not constant. They are time-dependent entities. So this is a fork? Yes, the one that will result in the reduction of the pore water pressure is essentially the this curve. This would be the case that the valve is closed. As soon as you open the valve, the pressure will go down. The pressure in the water will go down because the water escapes the system. Now, that stress needs to go somewhere. Where does it go? It goes to the intergranular stresses. Therefore, it will go. about it, how we can use this in terms of the design. For the purpose of design, we have a slow rate of construction and we have rapid rate of construction. Because I know some of you either decide to go to the construction management or like in the construction management track, you won't be, you won't be in the graduate courses in the geotech, so I have to mention that here. Our friends, our friends in the construction management and also on the management side, they want to expedite the process, right? So the sooner you can finish the project, the, soon the, the lower would be the labor costs and all the costs that are associated with that. For soils, you can do it because you have to allow for the dissipation of that pore water pressure. Let me just give you one quick example. We did a project for, again, that was for the Air Force Research Lab. One day they came in and they wanted to place a big, huge generator at the top of a concrete slab. And we, had, we were working on precast concrete slab, so they asked us to give them some of the concrete slab because they want to put it at the top of the soil so they can place their big, huge generators at the top of 
told them that it does not work. We said, okay, tell us what the thickness of the concrete slabs are. The thickness were about 11 inches, and they were very well reinforced. So they were looking at that and they said that, well, it's a very robust platform, so it's going to sustain the loads. We told them that it's not, it hasn't had to do with the loads for that specific concrete slab. Yes, your concrete slab can tolerate that load, but what happens underneath, on the soil? We were in Florida. What's the significance of Florida? A lot of rain, right? Where's the groundwater table? Right on the surface. It's very close to the surface, right? Fully saturated state. So here's what they did. Ultimately, they grabbed some of our concrete slabs, they dropped it at the top of the soil, and placed the generator at the top of it, and immediately it tilted. <laughs> Why? Because of that dissipation of the pore water pressure. It should allow for the dissipation of the pore water pressure for initial settlement. What was that condition? The condition was a rapid rate of loading, right? You did not allow for the dissipation of the pore water pressure to take place. And therefore, it destabilized the system. On the other hand, if you're looking at placing your embankment and allowing for the water to escape the system and you see the reduction of the soil layer, now your soil layer is so quote unquote consolidated, and that consolidation is correlated with a more robust platform or more predictable platform in terms of the deformations. So therefore, the time is also very important for us in terms of the construction. So you cannot go in and construct the structure immediately if you have a fully saturated clay. But that's a different story. All right. So. This especially, this signifies the importance of the transference of these stresses. This plot in general is called the transference of these stresses. And essentially it means that the stresses will transfer from the pore water to the intergranular salt grains. Right? So that's basically what it means in terms of the stress transference plots. Alright, so let's quickly get back to our discussion or our lecture notes and see how these are correlated with money. Or we're looking at the effective stress concept. Now, from this point on, as I mentioned, you see a lot of words. These uh, slides are essentially full of words, so you can have these descriptions and definitions in your uh, lecture slides as well. As in other materials, the stresses may act in soils as a result of an external load and the volumetric weight of the material itself. For civil engineering, tell me what kind of loading conditions do you have? The types of loads you have. Dead and live yes. loads, so you're familiar with that. What else? Seismic. Apart from the dead and live. Seismic loads. Wind Seismic wind. loads. Wind. All right, the water that you mentioned, I'm assuming with the rain and snow loads. Also, we have another component that has to do with the seepage forces. For instance, if you have an earth dam, the water passes through the soil and essentially exerts another component which is called the seepage forces. So seepage forces as well. What else? Wind load. Wind load. Right. What else? Earthquake, we mentioned that. Yes. Live load. Imagine you're responsible for the design of a petroleum platform, an oil platform in Gulf of Mexico. Waves, the impact forces associated with waves, right? So that's another type of loading condition that you might have. So you have to figure out what kind of loads you have specifically to the type of structure that you are designing. For us, we look at external loads. Pretty much all the things that we talked about so far are called external loads. And we have another component which is called the geostatic loads. And geostatic loads are essentially associated with the weight of the layer of soil. Again, if you decide to take a course in uh, advanced geotech, we talk about a specific course in Oroville Dam in California. The magnitude of the geostatic stresses associated with the weight of the soil above that is about, it's a little bit over 3,000 psi which result in the crushing of the particles way down there. So you also have to figure out what kind of loading that you have. Oftentimes you have the embankments. Embankments are compacted layers of the soil, and you place the highway, for instance, at the top of that. Therefore, you need to measure or you need to calculate the geostatic stresses. In our next lecture, if we have time, we'll start talking about how you can calculate the geostatic stresses in multi-layer soils.
All right. Let's move on with our um, definitions here. The pressure transmitted through the grain to grain at the contact points through a soil mass is termed as, in, is termed as intergranular or effective stresses. We also call that the design stress as well. It's known as the effective pressure since this pressure is responsible for the decrease in the void ratio or increase in the frictional resistance of the soil mass. And that's basically the definition of the shear strength of the soil. If the pores of the soil mass are filled with water in a saturated state, and if it is, uh, and if the pressure in, induced into the pore water rises to separate the grains, this pressure is termed as positive pore water pressure. Otherwise, in unsaturated state, we call them negative pore water pressure. We're going to talk about that and see how that is related in terms of the mechanical behavior of the soil. That we have. But in general, intuitively, you know that saturated soils they have lower load bearing capacity compared to unsaturated soils. And we will talk about how things will work out on the microstructural level when you're looking at the wedge of water or the meniscus of the water inside the soil structure. All right, so let's quickly talk about the general um, terminology that Terzaghi mentioned in 1936. Terzaghi is basically the grandfather of geotechnical engineering. And he also recognized the importance of the effective stresses that we have here. All the measurable effects of a change of stress, such as compression, distortion, and the change in the shearing resistance are exclusively due to the changes in effective stress. Every investigation of the stability of a saturated body of earth requires the knowledge of both the total and the neutral stresses. The neutral stress is what he's using as the pore water pressure that we talked about. Alright, so hopefully this will summarize and you will not forget what this equation is about. You cannot believe how many times the students make a mistake and basically replace the position of the total stress and the Notice that the total stress sits on the uh, left hand side and the pore water pressure and the effective stress is on the right hand side of the equation. Alright, so let's summarize what we talked about and complete our discussion about the intergranular stresses and pore water pressure. Effective stress represents the actual intergranular pressure that happens between soil water. This effective stress is the stress that influences the shear strength of the soil and volume changes of the soil, and therefore we use them for the purpose of design. Remember, for the purpose of design, you do your calculations of the magnitude of the stresses, and then you go to the specification and figure out what the factor of safety is. Once you figure out what the factor of safety is, you calculate your shear, shear strength or strength properties and figure out if the factor of safety is basically met or not. Factor of safety is just basically the ratio of calculated stresses and the expected strength of the material. That's basically that ratio. The total pressure at a point is termed neutral stresses. The total water pressure at the point is termed as the neutral stresses, which is basically that poor water pressure in a similar intensity. We can call that isotropic stress state or hydrostatic stress state as well. It is important to recognize that the neutral stress in unsaturated state acts to reduce the saturated state acts to reduce the strength of the material and in the unsaturated state will result in the increase in the strength of the material. And that's where we start talking about the surface tensional forces and how these surface tensional forces will result in the pulling of particles together and improve the intergranular stresses. And that would be the topic that we're going to talk about and tackle hopefully uh, if we come back on all right, so your uh, exams are great. You can go to your TA's office, NASA's office, I'm assuming that will be downstairs at the CTIS, and you can pick up your exam.